I think I'd be ignorant to say that Christianity is the only right religion. I don't know what the right religion is. It's just what I believe it is. Some people that I've met, it's just, I, I've had friends and, and the minute they find out about me or the minute that I, I do anything that doesn't follow their religion, I'm, they don't want anything to do with me. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad that can come out of it. And I'm not sure if it's from religion that the bad or the good comes out of it or whether it's the people. I respect a lot of faiths and I think that Christianity is a pillar that's influenced by the other great religions in the world. La cristianidad es muy importante porque podemos aprender valores cristianos donde no podemos, uh, donde descubrimos más acerca de nosotros. My view on anyone who claims to have a monopoly on truth is that there's no one truth about anything. I think that a lot of religions say the same thing in different ways. So right off the bat, I'll get this out of the way. Some of you guys are like, Larry's face looks weird today. Um, if you've been here before, I forgot my glasses. I'm not wearing contacts. So um, you're, I mean, I guess you could nod off today. I normally can see if you're sleeping on me, if you're making faces. I cannot today, so you're welcome. This is a gift. I think someone just tried to wave at me from the back. <laughs> I don't even know what you're doing. This is so good. Oh, so which is better, Larry with glasses or without? We'll decide later. Okay. <clears throat> uh, here's a real question. Which is better? People actually debate about this. Which one is better? All right, so here it is. Mountain biking or road biking? How many of you guys believe those? Oh, you guys all have opinions. Let's do this. Ra mountain biking. Okay, how about this one? Dutch Bros or Starbucks? Who's my Dutch? Oh, I got some Dutch people in the house. They're building a new one in Fairfield. It's going to be way easier to get to. That's legit. Or Starbucks. Okay. How about which team or university here in the Bay Area? You got Cal or Stanford? Everybody's got a strong opinion on that one, right? Now, here's the deal, friends. Some people would say, aren't they just all the same? Like, isn't it the same? Like, isn't coffee the same? Isn't bike riding, isn't like a cycle, isn't just the same? Isn't mountain biking, robot? It's just all of the same. I mean, is there really a difference between Dutch Bros and Starbucks or Cal and Stanford? Um, I mean, does it even matter? Isn't it all just the same? And who says that? Who says, well, aren't they just the same? It's usually people who don't deeply care or know about those things. But if you love to bicycle in California, you like to ride your road bike and the weather is nice and the wind is in your face, you have an opinion on which one is better between road biking, biking and mountain biking. And if you don't, you have learned that mountain bikers are much more kind than road bikers. <laughs> if you're a coffee fan, right, or you love drinking coffee or you like sitting down in the ambiance that comes with it, you have an opinion of which one is better between Dutch Bros and Starbucks. In fact, people who think that these are the same, they aren't people who deeply love or care about these things. But if you love cycling, you love coffee, you love college football, you know that they're not the same. And the question that we're going to be putting on the table this weekend is, aren't all religions essentially the same? Isn't it just like a different way to get to God? Essentially, isn't one religion a way to get to God and another religion a way to get to God? Are all different roads, inevitably, don't they just lead to the same place when it comes to religion? Are, are the different truths inevitably just to take people to the same final destination? Are all religions the same? And, and someone that believes that, or if, 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 that, if we believe that, that causes us Christians or those who are followers of Jesus to have to wrestle with this question, are we narrow-minded? Are, are we bigoted to believe that Jesus is the ultimate only way to have real life? Aren't they all the same? An important question to wrestle with, and that's what we're gonna be putting on the table today, and we're gonna be talking about a lot of stuff. We're actually gonna be talking about Muhammad, we're gonna talk about Buddha, we're gonna talk about Confucius, we're gonna talk about 85% or so of the world's religions and what separates Jesus from everything else. And this is, done, uh, this is done in a day and age today with coexist bumper stickers. Have you seen those ones? Have you seen the coexist bumper stickers? They use all the different religious symbols on them. And these days where people say, can't we just like believe what we wanna believe and then we can all just still get along? We're, we're talking about these types of things in a day and age where tolerance used to mean give people the right to be wrong, like have tolerance for that. Now tolerance means everyone has the right to be right. 
The only person to be feared and the only person that is wrong is a person that claims that they have the only right. And Jesus is going to do exactly that today, just as a forewarning. And according to our culture today, Jesus is actually gonna err on the side of hate speech. This year, the United Nations has tried to globally bring us around uh, this idea of combating hate speech itself. And to do that, they've written, the UN's written a policy for it that just was released this year. It defines it as any kind of communication and speech, writing, or behavior that attacks or uses pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or group on the basis of who they are, based on their religion, their ethnicity, their nationality, their race, color, descent, gender, or other identifying factors. I find it amazing that the United Nations started with religion first. This isn't going to be an attack today, but this is definitely pejorative and discriminatory language associated with what they're defining it as. What are those words? Those words means that if you, if you teach with a bias, one that is right and others are wrong, and that's exactly what Jesus does all of the time. Um, in fact, we're gonna uh, jump into scripture today where Jesus is using only pejorative and discriminatory language, and we're gonna look at when the world, this, this, where, what the world would call hate speech, and this is why he riled so many people up, but it's done in the most um, amazing act of love. It's done in, is in, in this rescue mission. And as far as we're concerned, as far as he's concerned about and from a one true monotheistic God and done in an act of sacrificing and love that is serving both you and I. And we're gonna be left with then in our culture here today with our culture's definitions of these things, wondering, so what do we do with this God? And here's why it's really for all of us, and this is so important. It's not just for the agnostic. It's not just for the atheist or for the Christian or for the Muslim or the Hindu or Confucius or the Taoist. Here's why it's for all of us, because we have to figure out what to do with this man and his teachings. I remember talking to a friend about Jesus, specifically Christianity. He was like, hey, man, that's great for you. Like, I think that's really good for you. I think religions and all religions and leaders are essentially the same, some of what we heard on that video. My view of life is, you know, I'm just gonna do the best that I can and uh, I'm gonna be a good person and everything's just kind of work out in the end. To which I said to him, no, 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 I, I really want you to know that Jesus insists, insists that the only way that you are gonna have real life is if you believe in him and trust him. And my friend looked at me and he said, this is the first time this happened, he says, Larry, like, this is kind of surprising me. Like, you're a good guy and stuff. Like, you're, you're a cool guy, but this is really narrow-minded of you to say something like that, to think that the only way that I'm gonna have life is through Jesus, you're narrow-minded. I mean, I got called narrow, I didn't know what to say, honestly, at the time. I was like, that didn't feel real great to be called narrow-minded. I also remember talking to another friend about like how my values and, and my systems and my social systems were changing because of Jesus. He had actually begun to change and shift some of my values and my social systems. And I asked them, hey, have you ever thought about what a relationship with God would actually mean then for you? And they like looked at me and stopped me in their tracks and says, I know what you're trying to do right now. I said, it, it, if you grew up in a Muslim faith or in a different country, right now you wouldn't be trying to convert me to Christianity. You'd be trying to convert me to something completely different. Larry, this is bigoted. You think that your faith is the only way? I didn't know what to say. Narrow-minded? Bigoted? Being called narrow-minded and bigoted caused me then, and maybe it's caused you, to ask questions about the Christian faith. Are are all religions right? Do they coexist? Are they essentially the same truth, different sides of the same truth, roads that then ultimately lead to God? I think just like cycling or coffee or college football, different universities realize that if you love those things, they're not the same. We're gonna see what Jesus has to say about this today. We're gonna find that this is an exclusive and inclusive faith. It is radically exclusive 
and radically inclusive. And to understand the Christian faith, you really have to understand Jesus' teachings. And my job is to teach you the truth of Jesus and to do it in the most loving, understanding way I can and to bring to light Jesus versus other religions according to Jesus. Jesus, who is the central figure and hero of Christian faith. He's the author and founder of the Christian faith. He's the perfecter of the Christian faith. And so what does he teach? Well, there's a lot of places we can look. I figured I would take four pages of the scripture in John, and we would talk about seven I am statements that he makes, which is really simple and really clear and extremely offensive to people. This is what shocked people back then and still shocks people today. And most of that because his I am statements start in a reflection of this Old Testament moment with Moses where God said, when Moses said, what, what should I, who should I say you are? And he said, I am. And so now Jesus is coming along, essentially raising his hand and saying, I am. I am God, which is the only religion where this figure does this, where he's claiming to be God. The first one, I am the bread of life. In other words, he's saying, I am God, and I am the bread of life. Because I am God, I then get to be the giver and can be your bread. And without me, you die, you perish. I am the one who can give you nourishment and satisfy your soul. I am the light of the world. You're in darkness, but you don't have to be in darkness because I am the light who came here to be your light. And if you believe in me, I will light your path and I will bring light into your darkness, into your life, because I am God and I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the, the only way you can get in is through me. The only way you can get into heaven or to God is through me. I am the good shepherd. I am the one who cares for you. No one can care for you like I care for you. Jesus is saying it is true. No one cares for you like Jesus cares for you. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus teaches, if you believe in me, you will be made new. You die here, yes, but you won't really die because I am the one who gives everlasting life, a resurrection life. I am the vine. All you gotta do is stay connected to me. You just stay connected to me and I'm the one who gives you life. I'm the one who makes you full and to have meaning. I am God. You stay connected to me, the vine. I am the way, the truth, the life. How does this coexist? It doesn't. It's so radically different from the teachings of the Quran. It's so radically different from the teachings of the Book of Mormon. It's so radically different from the teachings of Confucius and the meditations of Buddha and from any other world religion. It is him and only him. So real quickly, I would like to talk about each of these three statements that he just ended with here. Number one, I am the way. Jesus is the way. He says, I am the way. He's not a way for you to have a relationship with God. According to him, according to Jesus, he is the way. And so when my friends would say, Larry, this is like pretty narrow-minded of you, and this is bigoted to think that Jesus is the only way. Well, Jesus insists that he is the only way. Remember he said, I am the gate. If anyone enters, he will, he will be saved so Jesus now is speaking to a culture that understand people that were shepherds and there was fields and there was sheep to watch. And what would happen is at night, they would take them out into the fields and they would make a makeshift pin, maybe against a, some rocks, and they would put some other rocks around them or some brushes. And then what they would do as the shepherd is they would lay down in front of that as the gate. No one could enter into the sheep pen without going through them or passing by them. Same thing with exiting. And the shepherd would lay down at the gate, essentially saying that the only way for you to get in and to be cared for me as your God is to come through me. 
I am the gate. I am the only way that you can have a relationship where you are shepherded and cared for by God. Jesus is the way. So this means that it is, Christian faith is radically exclusive. Radically, because according to Jesus, you will have everlasting life where you can be shepherded by God. And the only way that you can get there forever is through Jesus. It's exclusive. He's the door. He's the way. He's the only way in. So the Christian faith is radically exclusive, but it's also radically inclusive. And I want you to understand this, that it's radically inclusive because the door, which is Jesus, comes comes every person, every single tribe. Let me emphasize every again. Every single tribe, nation, and tongue through the door of Jesus is welcome, radically inclusive. Through the door of Jesus comes the rich and the poor, male and female. Through the door of Jesus comes people that have a past that they're ashamed of and people that have a past that they are unashamed of, that they are proud of. Through the door of Jesus comes people from all kinds of different cultural backgrounds, different pasts, socioeconomic classes, different cultures that they've been a part of. Jesus invites every single person to himself because Jesus created and loves every single person. So Jesus is inviting you, invites everyone to the everlasting party. He invites you to be with him forever. He invites you to enjoy him, to go with him into the place of everlasting life. And he wants you. He says, come in. But the only way in is through the door of Jesus. So this makes Jesus unique from every other religion, from every other religious figure. Uh, the, the picture that Jesus gives us here in the Christian faith is that he is a door. And the picture of every other religion is a ladder, not a door. It's a ladder, a ladder of figuring out how to get your way to God, how to do this next right thing and get closer. And so you're trying to achieve something. So essentially every religion is a ladder, but, but, uh, but Jesus. Jesus is the door. The Muslim faith, it's a ladder of five pillars, five things that you must do if you're gonna climb your way to God. It's the second largest teaching. It comes from Islam. The Muslim world is very much, <clears throat> starts very much with Christianity and starts very much with Abraham. That's why there's this big fight in Israel today. Not today, today, but there's another big fight going on there. It's something called the Dome of the Rock. If you've seen this, it's at the Temple Mount. It's this big gold dome that's there. Um, in Jerusalem, uh, uh, Jews worship at the Wailing Wall. Muslims have the top of that. That was given to them in a treaty decades ago. Why? Because they were fighting over the same place. Why? Because they were fighting over the same place, the same start in the first part of the Bible where God promised Abraham that he would give him a great nation and he would do it through a son that God had given him that would give salvation into the world. The problem is Abraham didn't wait on God. Abraham then had a son, his first son, with another woman, a handsmaid, one of his maids, and he got her pregnant and they called the son Ishmael. Abraham then waited in faith in God in old age, and then God gave Abraham and Sarah, his wife, their son named Isaac. And there, the Christian world and the Muslim world splits. The Muslim world traces everything back to Ishmael, the first true son to them. The Christian world would go, that wasn't a son given by God. This was a mistake by Abraham. This wasn't what the promise was. This is a result of sin. And they're still fighting over that exact rock there. The question is, is did Abraham go to that rock to sacrifice his son Isaac, which is in the Old Testament, you can read about that story, or did he go there to sacrifice Ishmael there? And so then that's the Islam faith. Then you have a figure called Muhammad. Muhammad to them is the last and greatest of all the prophets. It's in the line of prophets 
uh, of in the, according to the Islam literature. And in that line, you have Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses, and then he's even in line with Jesus. And then about 500 years after Jesus comes Muhammad. Muhammad, they say, is the seal of the prophet. He's the one great final prophet. They recognize that there was a Jesus. He didn't do anything special. He was just another prophet that was on the list. But Muhammad is the one. He's the seal. He's God's manifestation, God's word to all of the people. So they feel like he has the final say. They have the final say that they've got the last draw, if you will. But Muhammad never claimed to be God. Muhammad never claimed to be from God. Muhammad never claimed to be of God, and Muhammad never claimed to be a deity. What Muhammad claimed to was to teach what God or Allah had given him, and to have, uh, they also to have a heaven, it's Jinnah. But this is a heaven of God's grace and mercy that you have to live up to like a ladder in the Quran. When you, when you live up to a higher righteousness, when you live up to better generosity, when you live up to better piety, then the grace and mercy of Allah will show you heaven, Jenna. But here's where this whole thing breaks down. And here's where our little coexist bumper sticker that I really wish could come true right off the bat goes sideways. You've got the teachings of Jesus and you have the teachings of Muhammad of the Quran. And they couldn't be more polar opposite than if you tried. You've got the Jesus claiming he is God. He is from God. He is sent by God, and he is the only way. And then you've got Muhammad not claiming to be a deity, but claiming that there's this whole other truth that you just have to follow up a ladder to get to heaven. There's no coexisting with these two. There's just not. You can't. But yet, 58% of the world's followers follow under some form of doctrine, a biblical doctrine of Christianity or some form of Islam. The Buddhist faith, it's four stages like a ladder as well of enlightenment that you have to climb through or go up. Four stages of enlightenment to get your way up to God. Buddha himself never claimed to be God. He never claimed to be from God. He never claimed to be a deity. Buddha saw himself as merely a teacher, he was a man who found enlightenment. He was a man who found divine Buddhahood. And he teaches through all kinds of mantras, all kinds of meditation, the way that you free yourself from suffering. There isn't a, a heaven per se. It's a rebirth. You don't have to keep going through the cycle of birth. You obtain enlightenment that frees you from this life and all the entrapments of it. Uh, there has been many Buddhas uh, over our time. And essentially reaching, reaching ultimate Buddha hood is that you evaporate into little diamond like whoosh, dust in the air. It's one of the more selfish religions. You serve others only to serve yourself. You are a good person to other people only so you will get more for yourself rather than a sacrificial service for the betterment of another human being in Majo Dei made in God's image and nothing for self. Hindu faith is a caste system. Wherever you are, you have to keep working your way through a reincarnation to finally reach nirvana. The Hindu religion is now primarily coming out of India. It's one of the most complex religions in the world. So many different scriptures, so many different spiritual writings. The, the, the Hindu religion itself claims to have 330 million gods. Now that's not to be taken literal, they say by them, but the Hindu religious is saying essentially there is a plethora, tens of thousands of gods and divas or gods or goddesses. And you've got three main ones that you can kind of work through in this Hindu religion, but it's complex act of worship and theology that everyone has these different gods and goddesses, and yet it all comes down to the same thing, reincarnation. How you live this life determines how your next life is gonna be. If you were good, the next life can be a little bit better. If you were bad, the next life's gonna be a little bit worse. And then the next time around, and the next time around, and some other basic tenets. You have to work your way up. You have to work your way up the ladder to get to God. Confucius was a Chinese philosopher. Confucianism is really, is, isn't really a religion. It's a philosophy. It's a way of life. 
Confucius made it very clear that he is not God. He is not from God. He was not part of God. He made it very clear that he was an educator to teach people there is a moral and ethical way to life. A search for wisdom in the passing on of knowledge and Confuciusism. There isn't a heaven. There's more of like this cosmic harmony that one can be a part of and it, that evolves and wraps through all of nature itself. Taoism is fairly close to that. They, they definitely have different tenets, but the yin and yang, you are pursuing an enlightenment, a cosmic harmony in the Taoist religion. All of those religions in a nutshell hold about 85% of humanity. Some of you are more familiar with Western culture religion that's fairly new, it's Mormonism. Mormonism is really interesting. The Book of Mormon, now suddenly God decided to plant in the United States because he loves it the most. <laughs> the real truth that was found by Joseph Smith and then he became, and then he decided, oh, I've gotten that God actually does want us to be a deity. We can have our own thing. We can then become uh, our own God and, and women are used as tools for pleasure and enjoyment and procreation. And then you can have your own planet, depending on how you do. It's still just a ladder to get to be a God because you can't ever get to the ultimate God. All of these religions have an answer for how to make mankind better, how you need to be better, how you need to be more generous, how you need to be more pious, more, righteous, uh, more righteousness, more giving, more responsibility, more meditation, more rituals. Every religion has an understanding that man himself is not good and needs to do better. And if there are many ways to get to God, and the way to get to God is getting better, then all of these religions do coexist. They're all just trying to get to a betterment of life, a higher plane, a higher meditation, a higher Buddhahood, a higher enlightenment, a higher nirvana. They're all in sync. And, and maybe religious people, maybe you've had experience with religious people. You grew up in a church that actually thought, if you would just obey the rules, if you would just live a moral life and you would be an upright person and people looked at you respectively and you'd done well in life and you'd achieved enough and you'd acquired enough and you'd been a kind enough person that you could then climb your way to God. Maybe some of you grew up in that kind of circumstances, but Jesus comes along and he says, you cannot climb your way to me. You simply cannot, no one can, because all of us, all of you, together, we have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all messed up. We've all sinned. We've all gone our own path, and we can't climb our way to him, but Jesus comes here for us. He doesn't come and say, I'm gonna show you the way. I'll show you the things that you must do, the way that you must act. Jesus says, no, 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 no. I am the way. I am the only way. And here's the really good news. If you come to me, I will bring you into everlasting life because I am the way. You can't find another way because I am the way. All you have to do, say, Jesus, I want to come to you. And Jesus says, come to me. I'm the door. All you have to do. His invitation is so beautiful to me. It's so inclusive because he wants you. He wants you. And it's so exclusive because the only way to everlasting life, the only way to him is through the door of Jesus. I am the way, Jesus says. He also says he is the truth. He is the truth. 
Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's an American astrophysicist. He's a writer. He had this funny quip I read. Quip I read. Um, he said, the good thing about science is that it's true, whether you believe it or not. <laughs> he's right. It's true. That's true. It's also true about truth. We live in a culture where um, people sometimes say, like, my truth, or, you know, you do your truth, or, you know, we're just doing our truth, as if, like, there's different truths. But the reality is there's just one truth. You can have an opinion about the truth. You can have a, a response about the truth. You can have a view about the truth, but your opinion or your response or your view doesn't change the fact whether something is true or not. And Jesus is ultimately true. He says, I am the truth. Now, this is really good. This is really good news for you because this means that he will never lie to you. He will never backstab you. He will never betray you. He will never show up differently today as the person he showed up yesterday. It's the same God. True, trustworthy. He is the way. He is the truth. And Jesus is not one of many truths. He is the truth and he is life. Jesus calls himself the life. Now, when Jesus says, I'm the life, the original language here, uh, there's three different words that could have been used for life. Some of these you'll recognize. The first is this, bios. Uh, bios in this life is where we get the word biology from, which means physical, physical life. So when Jesus says um, he is the life, he's not saying, using the word bios here, he's not saying this is, I'm where you get physical life, although we do get physical life ultimately because he was the creator, um, but this is not the word that he uses here. He could have also used another word for life, which is psyche, which is um, where we get our word uh, psychology, your, your mind, your soul life. But this is not the word that Jesus uses here when he says that I am the life. The word that he uses here when he says I am the life is this word zoe, which zoe means full, rich, abundant, eternal life with God. So Jesus makes this really bold claim right here. He says, I am the real life. I am the Zoe. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way that you're gonna have fullness in life with me, I'm the only way that you're gonna enjoy what God has given and has for me. The only way that you're gonna be forgiven and free is with me. Now, here's what's so fascinating about us followers of Jesus. And if you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, you're considering Christian faith, my guess is that you have considered it before, maybe because of your interaction with someone who is a follower of the faith of Jesus. And what happened was, is you saw their bio life, their psyche life, falling apart around them, and yet, that simple phrase that Jeff used this last week, and yet, they were still filled with joy. <laughs> how does that happen? Like how, do, how does that even happen? How do we meet people? Their physical life is deteriorating. Their mental life, their soul is struggling because we live in a broken and fallen world, and yet, they are filled with joy. How does that happen? Only Jesus does that. There is no other answer. There is no other drink. There is no other substitute that can fill that. Jesus brings us Zoe life. One of the reasons I love and I find it a great honor and joy in pastoring Northgate is I'm so privileged to have a front row seat with people who have challenges because all of us will. At some point, we have challenges in this broken and fallen world that we live in, our bio life. Our bodies will fall apart, our psyche, we're gonna, we're gonna have pain. We're gonna have a lot of it. And a lot of people have a lot of it. But those who have met Jesus, who is the ultimate life, who is the Zoe, I get to have a front row 
seat to the men and women of God where there are areas of their life or their children's life that are sometimes falling apart physically or mentally and emotionally, but they have ultimate life because they have Jesus. You can't do a coexist bumper sticker. You gotta take the Christian part out of it. Every other religion's friends can coexist, but this guy refuses to coexist because he really believes he is telling love and telling truth that everyone needs to know, and it's for everyone. And he said, even this, I will raise myself from the dead. <laughs> Who says that? I am the living water that quenches all thirst. Whatever you're looking for in life, whatever you're doing in life, whatever the reason why for you is, whatever you get in this world does not ultimately fulfill you because you were made for relationship with something other than this world. If, if this world could fulfill you, then none of us would need God because we're fulfilled, we're like good. But we were created for something higher. That's why we have a desire for it when everything does fall apart. Everything we thought was just holding us up and fulfilling us was just empty. We were created for a relationship with God. And there is no amount of money. There's no amount of position. There's no amount of sex. There is no amount of self-worth or value that you've tried that will ultimately fulfill you. You cannot be fulfilled by this world. We were created for something beyond. And he goes, I quench that. I quench it. Jesus is the only one who brings ultimate life. And the reason that he brings ultimate life is because he's alive. Now this, that right there, Jesus being alive fundamentally changes everything. Some world religions believe that Jesus lived and he died, but he did not die on a cross. Other world religions believe that Jesus lived and died, and he died, uh, and he, but he did not raise again from the dead. They insist that there's no way that he rose from the dead. Some emphasize he didn't die on a cross. Some emphasize he didn't raise from the dead. Us, we believe both. That his death on the cross for us is important because when he died, he took all of our shame, all of our stuff, all of our sin, all of our brokenness, all of our hurt, all the parts where we've created a problem, this chasm, and he placed it on him. But then he didn't only die and allow that to die with him, he then walked out of the tomb three days later. And this changes everything. Why? Because if Jesus is alive, then we can have life. The Bible's even honest about this. The Bible even says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then all of this is a waste of time. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, let, let us eat, drink, and be merry, and not even think about like the deeper meaning of life or the philosophical underpinnings or if, like, if there even is an afterlife. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you're wasting your time even watching this. But if Jesus rose from the dead, then everything he said is massively important. If Jesus rose from the dead, then he can give you life. If Jesus rose from the dead, then wouldn't you believe him when he's saying, I am the way, I'm the only way, the only way for you to be forgiven, the only way for you to have everlasting life. I am the truth. I am not one of many. I am not one of the best. I am the truth. And I am the life and the only one who can give you life. So my question for many of you is, are you ready to believe in him? Maybe some of you have even forgotten. Are you ready to believe in him again? That he's not just one of the best truths, he's the truth. 
He's the life, the door. Stop climbing a ladder. Are you ready to place your trust in him as your truth in your life today? Radically exclusive. The only way is through him, but radically inclusive. You're invited. You're invited. If you're ready to believe in Jesus right now, right where you are, you can ask him to make you his son or his daughter. The scripture says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, will be rescued, will be redeemed. He came to seek and save what was lost. And so right now, if you're believing him, right in this moment, if you're believing that he is the way, the truth, and the life, right in this moment, he's making you his son and daughter forever. And we wanna care for you. We wanna pray for you. If you're receiving the gift of Jesus today as a son or daughter of him, we, we wanna come alongside of you. We wanna encourage you. Jeff's gonna talk about it a little bit at the end of the very end of the service today and what your next step is. But if you're ready to place your faith in Jesus right now, I'm so, I'm so proud of you. He loves you so much. This is your next step. Some of you in here are maybe recommitting yourself to the way, to the truth, to the life. And some of you just got really an education on world religion. And, and maybe now can have a conversation that's not obnoxious and, and derogatory towards someone else, but is full of love and grace and mercy because you understand. It makes so much sense except for Jesus. And if you're looking for a really simple way, and this is for anyone else's in here, a simple way that I can just share the gospel really quickly is this, is that there is a God who loves you and has compassion for you. And it breaks his heart to see your heart broken and far from him and hurting and anxious and depressed and full of grief and empty because you just can't figure out what can fulfill you. So you have a God who is that. Then we have a problem. Because of people and because of his free will, we get ourselves into all kinds of nonsense. That people hurt us because of that and we hurt ourselves. And so God then gave us a solution. And that solution is Jesus, a door. Not a ladder to climb up and get that, but a door that has opened in, a gate that says, let me shepherd you, let me care for you, let me be your solution, let me help you take off of the shame and the guilt and the hurt and all the stuff that you're taking. Let me fill you with living water. Why don't you take a yoke with me and let me carry the heavy stuff? That was God's solution to our problems, Jesus. And the only thing we're left with, friends, is the invitation. What will you do with his invitation? Will you pray with me? Father, hallowed be your name. You are great, you are mighty. I am so blown away by your love and your grace and your mercy for us. You see us, may you see us. And may today in this moment as we respond and worship, may we see you, may we just get a glimpse, may we taste it, may we see the door and seek and knock and may you open it. All of this response, all of our worship in this place and this space is for you. Thank you for your gift of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Would you stand as we respond and worship?